So I am Mike McCandless. I'm a longtime committer on the Apache Lucene open source project. I am also the lead author of the second edition of Lucene in Action. Mike Sokolov, a uh, search veteran, worked many years with Lucene and um, just recently became a committer. And we are the two lucky souls up here today, but there is a large team at Amazon, a large distributed team, including people in Seattle, Tokyo, Dublin, San Francisco, Palo Alto, who have contributed to this effort. Some of them are in the audience here. So here's a quick outline of our talk. First, I'll give an overview of why we chose Lucene and what we're trying to solve at Amazon with Lucene. Then I'll describe our production architecture. I'll describe how we measure performance. The other mic will come up and describe some text analysis challenges we have indexing our catalog. He'll describe how we optimize for query latency, because we're very concerned with the long pole query latencies, P99+, plus. how we do ranking, and then I will wrap up. So I think most people are probably familiar with Amazon. You're probably customers of Amazon. You probably appreciate how difficult a search application, this particular search application is. Amazon has a very large catalog. It is a high velocity catalog. It's constantly, products are being added, prices are changing with high frequency. We have to keep up with that indexing rate, adding new documents and deleting documents and re replacing them. But at the same time, we have to handle a very high query rate all of the Amazon shoppers, and, and this is the search box you get at Amazon.com when you go to the top and, and type in a few search terms, that's hitting our service. When you search on the Amazon mobile app, that's hitting our service. So that query rate is very high. We have very strong latency requirements. We don't want customers to wait even at the, the long pole query latencies. We want to keep those very low. And then to make matters even more challenging, the query rate is extremely peaky. There's, there's a daily pattern, there's a weekly pattern, a monthly pattern, and then there's Prime Day, which is coming up very soon, and that's a completely different thing that's very challenging to handle. So, and people were unsure when we started this project whether Lucene is up to the task. So why did we pick Lucene? Well, Lucene is an amazing search engine. It is 20 years old this year. In 1999, Doug Cutting donated his, his visionary source code for this new search engine to SourceForge at the time, and it just developed a massive community, very passionate people, constantly iterating. It's hard to find a software project that is still successful after 20 years that has the innovation that Lucene has. Every major release is adding incredible new features. Block Max Wand, Codec Impacts showed up in the latest major release. And it's a high performance search engine. This isn't just a toy research engine that people like to just play with but never really use in practice. It's used in practice all over the place. If you look for a ride on Uber, if you do a search on Twitter or LinkedIn, if you are searching for a date on Tinder, you're using Lucene. Lucene is everywhere, and now some searches on Amazon.com are using Lucene. And it's because of this incredibly passionate community and the 20 years of compounded growth that Lucene is such an incredible search engine. Lucene is a pure Java um, ar architecture, and at the time, that was really shocking. In 1999, Java was this newfangled language. But today, that's a really great property. You don't have memory leaks in the traditional sense of memory leaks anymore. Lucene is an on-disk index, so it can scale to indices much larger than the free RAM on a computer and still have good latency. It has amazing concurrency. So as computers, in 1999, computers didn't have that much concurrency these days, they have amazing concurrency. You get 72 cores on a single box. The, the solid state disks that are in machines, they are really fast. They are also incredibly concurrent. Under the hood, they have many different channels that they can handle saturated I.O. So Lucene taps into all of that, of that capability. It handles that concurrency very well. And it has a segmented architecture. And if you're curious how Lucene deals with merging segments, because new segments are written and they're small, and over time you get too many little segments, it merges them together in the background into bigger, bigger segments. There's a fun YouTube video that shows you how that process works. And it has a very nice near real-time architecture used so you can search all the documents you indexed up until a point, and you can continue indexing while you're searching. And then every few seconds, you can just open a new reader, and it will search the point-in-time view of that index as of when you refreshed it. So that, and that, that refresh operation is not that costly. It's in proportion to how many documents were indexed since you last refreshed. And that write once design, those segments are written once and they never change. And that gives very good index compression. Lucene is able to, to very compactly write the values because it knows the values it just wrote won't be updated. 
Instead, another segment will be written in the future. So we, in, in building this, this search application on top of Lucene, we are using a huge number of Lucene's features. And so this is one of the important characteristics that Lucene had for our search problem. I mentioned the near real-time capability. We're actually using a near real-time segment replication to distribute the index across many replicas. And this is different from how Elasticsearch and Solar work today. We are using a feature called concurrent searching. So modern computers that have massive concurrency, we have hard queries to answer. They take a lot of computation. So we now use multiple threads to answer that, that query. And that's a feature that's available in Lucene, but it hasn't been exposed in Elasticsearch or Solar yet. We use index sorting. So we have this notion of whether a, a, a product is a good product, lots of people are looking at it and purchasing it, or a not good product, it's not really getting much engagement. We sort the index by that criteria, and it allows us to do early termination on difficult queries. We're using index time joins to handle offer information, because every, every product has multiple offers, and that's an index time join for us. It's very efficient. Dimensional points was added in Lucene 6. People think dimensional points is a geospatial filter, and it does a very good job at that. It's also a very generic multidimensional index, and we're using that to handle the kinds of specials that we get on Prime Day. Lucene's extensibility APIs, a co collectors, doc value source queries. Lucene has a, it's a very modular architecture, and it's very easy to build your own custom implementations of these classes. Those are great touch points to customize the behavior. Custom term frequencies for representing um, how, how, custom, how engaged an ASIN is. So that was a feature that was not available in Lucene in the beginning, and we added that, we contributed that feature back upstream, and people have since built on top of it and done all sorts of interesting things. Faceting, multi-phase ranking, expression, so the list goes on and on, and the, especially because those two top two features were not available in Elasticsearch and Solar, but also because we're heavily customizing many different parts of Lucene. We are building directly on top of Lucene. We're not using Elasticsearch or Solar today. And um, thinking back to Isabel's keynote this morning, she, she mentioned she had a point in her talk where she said, contributions back upstream are dependent on your situation and, and where you are at your company. And that's what happened at Amazon too. Early on, as we were building this search engine on top of Lucene, we hit a bunch of rough corners, a few small bugs, you know, some performance issues. And early on, we pushed a lot of good stuff back upstream, and that benefits the whole community. It benefits everyone who's using Lucene, Elasticsearch, and Solar. So that's a healthy process that works well inside our team. And less so lately, because Lucene's working really well for us right now. OK, I'm going to switch gears and talk about our production architecture sort of at a high level. First, I wanted to dive into that first feature that I listed, near real-time segment replication. So when you have a search index that's too big for one computer to handle, even with all of its concurrency and solid state disks, you shard it. You just take the index and you break it up evenly into n pieces. Then if, each, if one of those n pieces is still too, too hard to handle the query load, how many queries per second you have to handle, then you replicate that index. So you have a matrix structure for search clusters, and that's how Elasticsearch and Solar and our production architecture work as well. However, when you add documents to that index, you have to have a way to get the new documents to all of the replicas. So you have to, when the document comes in, you have to figure out which shard it goes to. And then in the case of Elasticsearch and Solar Cloud, the document is re-indexed across all the replicas. That it wouldn't really scale very well for us because we have very deep replicas. The search traffic is really peaky, especially on Prime Days and Black Fridays. So we use a feature called near real-time segment replication which takes advantage of Lucene's write-once architecture. So one indexer node will write these new segments, and then we copy those segments out to all of the replicas, and we, we take advantage of AWS's S3, its fast networks. It's a very fast operation for us to distribute those new checkpoints out to all the replicas. And then we rely on Kinesis to make sure we don't lose any documents. So if, 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 a, if an indexer goes down, we can fall back in the Kinesis queue and replay the updates. So in addition to Kinesis, we're using a ton of AWS features. It's a great time to build a search application because you can just stand on the shoulders of giants. All of these amazing services that are available in AWS, you don't have to reinvent anymore. So we use Elastic Container Service to run each component of our architecture. DynamoDB is used to hold the entire catalog that we're indexing, so we can sort of pull from that to re-index the, the, the whole index. 
Um, Kinesis queues are bringing in the real-time changes. We use GURPC APIs to tell the nodes when they should refresh and, and uh, save snapshots to S3. And one unique property of our infrastructure is we rebuild the entire search index every time we push any, any software change. It could be a trivial change. It could just be a Javadoc change or readme file. Or it could be a drastic change, introducing a different approach for synonyms. So because it's kind of risky to determine which software changes might have impacted the index and which, which haven't, we just rebuild on every, on every push. And it's, Lucene is incredibly fast at re-indexing, so that architecture works fine for us. And because we're doing near real-time segment replication, we can afford to just do that on one node and copy the segments out to the replicas. So this is a picture that shows roughly how it works. I'll go through it really quickly. A query comes in at the top, that's one request, into a component we call the Blender. The Blender fans out that request to multiple departments in Amazon's catalog. Each department has a collator in front, and the collator, I think, is kind of like the coordinating node in Elasticsearch. It receives a query. It figures out which shards and which replicas it's going to talk to. It waits for them to reply. It might retry if something goes wrong, and then it merges the results back. So that's a collator coming down here picking a replica in every column, each shard is one column here, and then sending the response back to the customer. These are the indexing nodes. So on top of each column, we have an indexer who's taking, consuming the Kinesis queues and DynamoDB, pushing checkpoints or snapshots into S3, and then the replicas are copying from S3 and lighting those new segments for searching. So when Lucene needs to search its index, it's a segmented architecture, the query comes in, the query checks at each segment, gets the best hits from every segment, merges those results together, and sends it back. It's just like a sharded architecture, but it's happening, with, happening within one Lucene index. But if you do that sequentially, which is the default for, for Lucene and, and is how Elasticsearch and Solar work, you pay a latency cost for all of those segments. And if your query is costly and your shard is big enough, that latency starts to push into uncomfortable numbers of milliseconds. So we use the, the, the Lucene feature that allows us, you just pass an executive, executor service to Index Searcher, and when, that, when you pass that, Index Searcher will take the query and dispatch the query across multiple segments concurrently. The small segments are coalesced into one work unit, so one thread will do the small segments. And then when those threads have all finished, it does, does a join on all the results and, and merges them and returns them back. This is really, really good, useful for us. This allows us to make our shards larger and keep our query latencies lower until you, we approach capacity. So as we get close to redline QPS, this feature hurts us because of the thread switching. The overhead of switching between threads adds some cost, and the redline QPS, the redline capacity, is a little worse as a result. But it's a good trade-off from our standpoint. We don't try to run our clusters at redline, and we have other tools we can use to deal with a redline situation. So it's far more important that we bring down our query latencies below redline. We noticed one strange thing. When we first launched our service, we have all sorts of wonderful metrics. This is a chart showing you two metrics. The blue line, which was the first metric we looked at, we didn't know about the green line yet, is our P99939 query latency, and we, we had to erase the axes, I'm sorry, we weren't allowed to show exact numbers here, but the sawtooth pattern is what was very strange about this. We all sort of scratched our heads and looked at our service, and why would it have such a sharp behavior where suddenly the latency jumps and then kind of goes down again? So then we, we realized, we had a, a theory that it was, it was related to Lucene's segmented architecture and, could our concurrent, and how we take advantage of concurrent search. And what is happening is, the green line is showing how many bytes were just copied out to the replicas. So the spikes in the green line are large segment merges. So normally, when Lucene merges small segments into a big one, that's a good thing, because you've, you've taken 10 small segments and made a big one, you don't, have to, you don't have to open so many files, you don't have to visit all these little segments, it's supposed to be a good thing. And overall, it is a good thing, it, it, brings, it brings up your capacity, but in our case, because we do concurrent search across segments, those large segments were caused, causing us more latency because now we lost some concurrency. Previously, when we had the 10 segments, we would allow 10 threads to search, but now we have only one thread searching. So I think there are some improvements we can do here, and we're looking at whether we can use multiple threads even inside one large segment. 
and then that would sort of smooth away those, those sawtooth patterns. Okay, changing gears to how we measure performance. So we all have wonderful unit tests, integration tests, all sorts of approval steps that we have in our pipelines. There's all these things we have to catch functional errors, but catching performance regressions is a lot harder. So to help us with that, and it's not a perfect solution, but it works really well, we have a set of internal benchmarks that are similar to the public Lucene benchmarks that run every night. And these benchmarks, they wake up, they take a, a, a recent snapshot of the catalog, they take a recent snapshot of actual customer queries, they index the catalog, they send the queries to that index, and they measure all sorts of metrics, our long pull query latencies, our throughput, memory usage, number of garbage collection events, all sorts of metrics, and chart those in nightly graphs, which we go and look at every so often to catch accidental regressions they have caught a lot of accidental regressions. It's easy to make a wonderful looking change that passes all tests and everything's fine and you notice it had a 20% hit to your P99. We also measure functionality. So it's not just performance, but whether a change that should have just been an optimization altered the search results. So that's a very bad situation. If we, if we change the search order and we didn't expect to, our benchmarks will, will help us catch that. So these same benchmarks that run in a nightly machine, they also are available for developers to run so that if they made a performance change, they want to see what the impact was, they can do that in the privacy of their workspace. They can iterate and fix it and makes it a lot easier and a lot safer to make exciting changes. So I mentioned that long pull query latency is something we really pay attention to. When we measure our long pull latency, we use a load testing client. It's an in-house load testing client that uses, it's an open loop client. So an open loop client is one that sends the request and doesn't wait for the response. It goes back to its thread pool and it sends another request when it's time to send it. There are quite a few frustratingly high number of load testing clients that don't do this. They use a closed loop test to measure query latencies and that will lie. You will get rosy looking results when in fact you have horrible results. If you, if you look up um, Gil Tenney did a great talk describing why your load testing client is probably lying to you. So if your load testing client is not using an open loop, go back and look at it, watch that talk, and, and find a better load testing client. Um, Redline QPS, we measure with a closed loop client. So a closed loop client will just send a request and wait for the response. And then when it gets it, send another request. And if you, if you run with enough clients, the, the, the reports, the metrics measured by that closed loop client will be close to your Redline capacity. When we measure latency, there's a, we, we sort of struggle with what, at what load should we measure latency. Because if you measure latency at redline, that's not so interesting. There's just a lot of waiting happening. If you measure at 50% performance with a Poisson process, which is a mathematical model of how queries arrive in practice, then you're going to also measure a lot of contention. So we've sort of changed where we measure latency. We, we measure at a fairly low rate because we, we really want to measure whether the software got any slower at replying, at computing the answer to a query. When we looked at our benchmarks, this was a very interesting thing we noticed. Lucene had absolutely horrible refresh times, and which was very surprising because I know from Lucene's nightly benchmarks, it doesn't have horrible refresh times. So we realized that the way we were using Lucene and how Lucene's concurrency model works weren't, wasn't a good match. So with Lucene's indexing, if you have lots of threads doing indexing, it's wonderfully concurrent, you're saturating CPU or IO, you're getting amazing throughput. But then if you, stop, if you pause your indexing threads and wait for them to all finish, which is a common case, you know, you index all of your catalog and once it's all indexed, then you ask Lucene to commit. That is a single threaded operation in Lucene today which is really weird because the indexing was nice and concurrent and now you do a refresh and it's really slow. So we, uh, in our benchmarks, we noticed that was incredibly slow. We opened an issue, Simon replied on the issue and said, this is how you can fix it with an existing Lucene API. We made that fix and it's much faster. Going from a single thread to 64 threads committing is a gigantic improvement in your refresh times. The benchmarks that we use are able to tap into some amazing metrics that would normally be quite hard to get except for the fact that Lucene has really good abstractions. Directory reader is the abstraction for reading an index uh, uh, from a disk directory. We use that to count how many term dictionary lookups we're doing, because that's a fairly costly operation in Lucene. We have a bunch of custom code that does terms dictionary lookups, and that, that's something we chart, is how many times a single query had to look up terms. We wrap directory and index input to gather IO counters. So we have a metric that tells us how many IOPS 
did the query do? Each query, we have this metric. How many bytes did it read? And if we push a change that doubled the number of bytes, then we want to go back and understand why that happened. So those metrics make those abstractions, which Doug Cutting a long time ago had the foresight to create. Most of his abstractions are still in Lucene today. Those are incredible tools for doing gathering custom metrics for, for a search engine. We learned the lesson that everyone else has learned already, that full garbage collection is bad. Lucene is an amazingly lightweight search engine. It does not allocate much memory to handle a query, and, and many concurrent queries in flight really don't allocate that much memory. We made that, we broke that, because we had some places that we were using a lot of heap, places we didn't think would be so bad, but under load, it turned out to be quite bad. And, and we don't trust G1 GC yet, although Uwe told me I should start trusting it. We still use the, the now deprecated concurrent collector because we want low pause times and we don't mind trading off some throughput to get that. Azul has an awesome tool called jhiccup. This is a way to monitor the pauses you see in production, not just from garbage collection, but from the operating system scheduler, your IO devices. If there are any unexpected pauses, that will tell you the best you can do on your long pull query latencies. Because if the JVM is pausing you, the machine is pausing you, you can't do any better than that, no matter how fast you make your code. So when we, when we had problems with the garbage collector, we were hitting full stop the world events. We, we fixed a few places that were holding on to too much heap. We increased our heap size, and we poached a few parameters from Elasticsearch that caused the concurrent collector to work a little harder, to kick in a little sooner, and that was a big improvement for us. And this chart is not our benchmark chart. This is from Lucene's nightly benchmarks, just an illustration of how much you have to pay attention to your garbage collector. This is showing the performance of a sloppy phrase query on a full Wikipedia index, so it's kind of a costly query for Lucene to run. It was sort of fine you know, through months. It, it, it was fine for quite a while back before this. But then suddenly, we upgraded Lucene's nightly benchmarks to JDK 11 and saw a substantial 12% you know, drop in the, in the QPS performance of this one query. There was a discussion on the dev list. Uwe said it must be the garbage collector. And so I went back and fixed the Java invocation to go back to the, the throughput collector. Parallel GC, and that restored quite a bit of our performance, not all of it, so there's still something missing there. But garbage collection is difficult. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Sparky. You can, you can still call me Mike, it's okay. Uh, okay, well, Mike will come back at the end and we'll try to leave some room for questions, but I'm going to take the rest of this. So, um, Analysis. I mean, everybody has to deal with text. Text is, you know, one of the great things about Lucene is it gives you so many tools for dealing with text. Um, you know, a, 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 there's an analyzer for every language. There are many, many tools you can apply. However, um, every application is unique in its in its own special way, and um, uh, we're we're no different. We we found we had some kind of special challenges to deal with. Part of it, part of this also comes from uh, trying to maintain the history of an engine that was already built in house over ten years and uh, maintain compatibility because we uh, we we had a kind of a uh, a goal not to change the user's search results too much during this port because we didn't want to test too many things all at once. So how do we maintain that while completely shifting you know the way that the analysis is being done underneath? We committed to. Um, to doing basically a, a, a Lucene native uh, analyzer. I mean, early on we said, well, we could just port the existing code, wrap it all up as a tokenizer, and say, well, that's our that's our analysis chain. Instead, we decided to break it up into pieces, and that was more challenging. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, here's one. Uh, what does plain mean to you? Well. Obviously, like many words, it has many meanings. Um, you know, even in the context of shopping, uh, could mean many different things. Um, you know, it could be could be an airplane. Uh, Amazon doesn't sell airplanes, but it does sell toy airplanes and airplane keychains. I guess uh, could also mean, you know, in English, a uh, a tool, a bench plane or a a. Uh, a plane. So when someone's searching for, for that, we want to give them the right, the right answer. Well, uh, what is it? Well, the thing is what we'd like to be able to do is apply some synonyms. If someone searches for airplane, but the document only said plane, you know, we'd like it to match. So we want to apply an airplane to plane synonym. But if we do that, we don't want when they search for airplane for them to be finding bench planes. So this is kind of a challenging problem. The good news is we're doing our synonyms at index time. We know what the documents are. I mean, we, we know 
for example, that this is uh, not a toy, we know it's a tool. So we can apply different synonyms in different contexts. That's, that's the sort of the theme here, is context-sensitive analysis. We want to be able to apply different analysis chains depending on maybe the value that comes from another field, in this case, the category that the document is in. Um, that's kind of challenging to do, uh, or has been challenging to do in Lucene's APIs because you, the way that you typically apply an analyzer is by specifying uh, which field it applies to. So you say, okay, I'm going to use this analyzer for the title, this one for the fu full body text, but it doesn't really give you a way of combining information that come from other fields. So uh, we had to write some custom code around that. And then at some point, a discussion on the mailing list led to some entirely new way of handling this, which is a conditional token filter, which we didn't have time to use because it came out later. But I think that'll be a nice uh, new way that you can do this kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about synonyms. Um, another thing that you know was kind of unique in our use case in the analysis chain is the way we handle numbers. Um, uh, like. Searching for products on a, in, a, in a catalog, uh, people really care about the sizes, uh, the age that the products are for, the prices, um, you know, the, the, the voltage that, the, that the, the, the tool works at, and so on. So the numbers are really important in a way that they aren't so much in a, a traditional, you know, let's say, uh, full text search. Um, so some of the things we do are like toy for three-year-old. We want it to match this age range, two to four years, but nowhere in the text of that document does it say three. So, you know, we expand the range to include all the intermediate numbers. Uh, you know, we want to do uh, number unit uh, translation so that you can, you can search for, uh, you know, 1.5 liters and we don't match uh, things that are about 1.5 volts or what have you. Um, and then handling decimals and fractions and other kinds of numbers with punctuation, um, you know, is, is, is a challenge. I, I ask people to ask me about tires today. Only, only a few people did. But uh, we, you know, we had a bug with tire sizes because tire sizes have slashes in them. They're often written as several numbers with slashes in them. And uh, you know, we confuse them with fractions. So there's just all these subtleties. Um, and, and it's really tricky building analysis, right? Because you, you um, change one thing in one place, and it changes everything <laughs> somewhere else. Even though it's a nice modular chain of, of filters, right? They're, they impact each other. I think we all have, know that if we fiddled with uh, with analysis. One of the things, uh, the consequences of having all this specialized punctuation handling is that we can't really use standard tokenizer. Standard tokenizer is what most people use. It, it works great unless you're very fussy about punctuation, but then you can't use it because it drops all your punctuation. So instead we use, you know, basic, a basic tokenizer with white space and then later on we apply a uh, word delimiter graph filter. Word delimiter graph filter is like the Swiss army knife of, of analysis chains. I mean, it handles a special case of, of sort of secondary tokenization, right? It, you, you can do it, if you didn't tokenize on those things early, the punctuation or the non-letter number characters or whatever, it'll split them up later. But it leads, it leads to trouble, like if it's, it's useful, but if you don't have to use it, I would say don't use it because it, it causes, uh, Lucene gets a little bit unhappy if you have multiple things that split your uh, text into tokens. Anyway, it, but you can use it and we do, it's pretty good. Um, but uh, the one takeaway from all this analysis stuff, there's, n there's not really a theme here because it's just a lot of little problems one after another, right? And you have to solve them and keep working at it until you get it right. And we did that. But uh, I would love it if we could, like, isn't machine learning the sauce that's supposed to solve all our problems? Like, would somebody please apply it to tokenization? I would love, I would love that. Uh, I think we need that. There's an opportunity here. I mean, this is like the oldest part of search, but it needs some work. Okay, so that's enough about analysis. Um, query optimization. So I'm gonna, Mike referred to a few of these things at all, uh, before, sorry, uh, and uh, I'll just dive a little deeper. Um, you know, latency is important for us. Our customers are humans. We don't want them to have to wait. If they wait too long, they'll go away. They'll buy things somewhere else. Um, speed is super important. You know, it's important in, in every dimension. Delivery has always been one of Amazon's like prime uh, promises. We'll get it to you fast, but you know, it's also part of the search experience. And like, if you have to wait for three seconds, you, you know, it's just not good. So, um, you know, w w one of the tricks. And th this was a, this was a cool idea that I think many people can use. And uh, you know, I'm. It's called index queries here. The, there's a couple of different ideas here. They both come out of like what I would call adaptive indexing. So the basic idea is look at your queries, see what people are searching for commonly, and then use that to inform your indexing process. And it's a circular thing and it, it's tricky, but you can get some nice gains from it. So what we did here 
is we went through our query logs, uh, you know, printed the Lucene query that it was we were parsing out of after doing all our processing, and uh, we saw, well, hey, like all our queries have the same, you know, set of, of filters. They're all filtering on, you know, these are some very common things that say, this document is a product. Uh, it was not suppressed by some rule, that some business rule someone applied. It's not a, an adult product. Most queries are like this, right? And um, there, are, there are more filters than that, I didn't show you all of them, that are repeated over and over. And, uh, you know, Lucene is really fast at matching these very simple term queries and then conjoining them together, finding the documents that match all of them. Uh, but it's still wasted effort. Um, like, if we can replace all of those with a single term, hey, we can, we can go faster. So basically what we do is we treat the queries as documents. We look for commonly occurring subqueries. We factor them out of the queries and the documents. So when we're indexing, we find documents that match these commonly occurring subqueries, and we index a single term to represent that. And then at query time, we do the same thing, replace all those terms, that whole term thing with a single term query. And we got a nice speed up from that. Um, this is a little more about how that works. Uh, I mean, in general, the problem's hard because Boolean expressions are trees. You know, you, you, you factoring them is, is kind of a challenging problem, but our queries are simpler. You know, we have a, a, a process that generates them that doesn't create these very deep trees, so that helped. Also, I'll just give a shout out to this FP growth algorithm. I don't know if anybody's encountered it. I learned about it during the course of this work, and it's pretty cool. It, it finds commonly occurring sub-patterns uh, you know, in queries. It's commonly applied like in database world, and, it, and it, it sped things up on our indexing side. So uh, yeah, this is kind of the results that we saw. This was early on, you know, but uh, we saw a nice boost at that time, 30% in improvement to our QPS, you know, by avoiding all this repetitive work. And uh, latency went way down. I, I think maybe a little different now, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice boost. We did a similar thing with full text. So the thing I showed you before was really just for kind of filters, you know, uh, on, on very simple terms. But you can also apply similar optimization to, you know, text. It's a little different here because the cardinalities of the terms are different. You have to kind of set different thresholds about how many of these things you index so that you don't blow out various um, uh, uh, limits. But uh, I wanted to show these partly just to show it's a cool idea, but also because the terms are kind of interesting, I think, and it highlights a few things about our system. One of them is that, hey, this data is changing all the time. I mean, you can see Valentine's Day down there at the bottom. Um, it's not all that interesting for us to index Valentine's Day most of the year. Um, so if we build this index, you know, this, this kind of set of uh, indexed tuples and uh, queries once and leave it, then we're, uh, our performance is going to slowly drop. And that's kind of a dangerous thing to have in a production system. You know, you thought your performance was this, but if you just leave it alone and don't do anything, it's slowly going to degrade, right? Oh, that's not a good situation to be in. So, um, so you know, you really need, if you do this kind of uh, circular kind of indexing of, uh, you know, dynamic indexing, you, you, you have to have an automated process that's continually updating it. And I think the, the faster that loop works, the better off uh, you are. Uh, because, you know, query tr patterns change very quickly. Uh, new product drops. Suddenly, there are all these queries for a thing you never saw before. Anyway, yeah, that's kind of a... Uh, oh, yeah, another optimization. This is, this is cool. I mean, Mike talked a little bit about this, but just to elaborate. So lightning deals, what, what are they? Basically, we want to sell, you know, at a discount on for two hours. You know, buy it now. Get it for 15% less or whatever. So they have all these deals. Uh, but searching for those deals traditionally was very expensive. They were implemented as a post filter. You'd, you'd find all the matching documents, and then after the fact, you'd, you'd search them all to see if they were, if you know, they, they matched your deal. Well, uh, we've replaced that using the um, dimensional points in Lucene. We saw a very nice speed up. The funny thing about these dimensional points, is, as, as you know maybe, or as Mike said before, they, they were originally designed for geo queries. So like for example, in that region there, you see a red, you know, region, uh, the query might find uh, anything in that region by essentially breaking it up into little rectangular subregions and then uh, subdividing them uh, to, match, to match the boundary using this tree-like structure in multiple dimensions, well, two here. But you can use it for other kinds of data. So for this example, the lightning deals, we have um, really three dimensions. We've got the start time, the end time, and 
an identifier, you know, which is just which deal is it? Uh, and uh, we actually, the, like, the weird idea was, well, that identifier isn't a number, but we can throw it in there, you know, and it doesn't have any ordering properties, but it's still a dimension, and it actually works out great. So we're hoping uh, that we see uh, that we, you know, this saves us from a prime day uh, disaster. No, it, 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 it's, we've already seen good speed ups, so that, that'll be good. Okay, well, how am I doing on time? Uh, 40 minutes in. I want to save some time for questions. Uh, six minutes left. So I'm probably not going to get all the way into this last thing because it's kind of complicated, but I'll give a, just a gloss on it. Um, Basically, the story here is we have some very expensive machine learned models that we want to apply, uh, but um, you know we also have a lot of documents. We can't score those those models across all our documents. We have these tight latency guarantees. So how do we do it? Basically, we do multi-phase ranking. Uh, first phase. Let's see. What did I? This isn't really what the slide says. But uh, why are they expensive? Well, basically, they just do a lot of stuff. Uh, one funny story is we initially tried to m model these these scoring models as Lucene expressions. I mean, a lot of people do that, right? You take you take your your recency time and your relevance score from text, and you kind of fold them together into a function. And Lucene will pretty efficiently compute that by compiling you know this JavaScript looking expression into Java, and then it's very fast. But we discovered that uh, you can your expression has a limit, a function, a Java function, cannot have more than 64,000 expressions in it. Uh, so, it, you know, otherwise it runs into JVM limits. And these are really big, these things. So it just wasn't, it just wasn't working, you know. So we had to write custom code for that part of it. But, but anyway, it just gives, illustrates that they're kind of expensive. Um, so what do we do is we do this multi-phase ranking thing. The first phase, we do an index uh, you know, a static rank that's that's done at indexing time. We just pick the top end documents from that, and we say, well, we'll just rescore those with our less, our more expensive model. And we actually do two phases of that. We have a kind of intermediate expense model, and um, I think that uh, in the interests of saving time for questions, I'm not going to tell you about this really cool thing that we did. But I'll just I'll just leave you with a, a problem to think about. You may remember, and this illustrates a little bit, when Mike talked about concurrent searching across multiple segments before, that he showed that picture, which may not be in your head anymore, but there were, you know, how do we, we, we collect all these documents across all the segments, then we merge sort them, right? Well, when we did that, we collected, let's say we wanted n documents. We collected n documents per segment, and then we threw most of them away. Well, we probably didn't need to do that. I mean, most of them came out of the big segments. Fewer of them came out of the small segments. So anyway, we did some stuff to prorate that and got a little speed up. Uh, so that was kind of a whirlwind tour. This is more about this is showing you how the collection works when it's proportional. Um, and you know, you run the risk of not getting quite the same results you would have done otherwise, but you get a speed up from it. So that was a kind of a neat thing. Uh, yeah, I think I'll I'll leave that there and uh, ask Mike to come up and wrap us up. Okay, real quick. So yeah, it turns out Lucene can handle this search application. It's been really challenging. We're using all kinds of features. We push changes back upstream, but it's working really well. If you go and search on Amazon.com today, you're using Lucene sometimes. It's not 100% out there yet. Segment replication is incredibly efficient if you have deep replica count. So that's something I, I hope someday Elasticsearch will offer it as an option. If, if you have really deep, deep re replicas, it would be a big win. We're using multiple threads to handle one query is incredibly, incredibly important if you care about latency and you're not always running at redline. And come join us if you like working on open source software on really challenging high scale search problems we are hiring. So unfortunately, we probably only have time for one question, and this was an amazing talk. So show of hands who wants to ask a question, and Mike and Mike will pick from the audience. One, two. Well, we've got to go with the first. Yeah, okay. Guys. Okay. It was, it's like Jeopardy. You can come to our booth. We have a booth downstairs, so if you want to ask us more challenging questions, come and ask us. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I just have one question related to synonyms handling. So you mentioned... Uh, you do synonyms during indexing time. Uh, do you think you are missing the context of the user or and the user query, uh, or you, do you also apply a, a different type of synonyms during qu query time? Uh, 
So, yeah, probably. I, I think it's done in the interest of efficiency for the most part. Uh, you know, although this, this document context is something we wouldn't have at query time. So there's a trade-off. I think there's a, there's a role for both. Um, we, there are other processes that we didn't talk about which run kind of prior to the search engine as well, and they, they do some of that work too. There's some kind of query rewriting that happens before we see it. But, but I think there's room for more, yeah. In theory, we have one minute left. So, any other question? Other the, who's the? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. So, you said that uh, Lucene powers most of the searches. What else? Uh, what else do you use for powering the rest of the searches? Well, so so Lucene is used all over the place at Amazon for situations that aren't product search. Lucene, Elasticsearch, and Solar. So, we're just talking about in the product search situation. Amazon started with an in-house search engine. They developed years ago. It's highly tuned to what Amazon customers need for search, and it was highly challenging to replicate its behavior on top of Lucene. So that's what handles the rest of the queries.